Thank you, Dean Smith. Um, just want to introduce our speaker for tonight, Ms. H. Augusta Fain, is uh, the Contracts Director for the Defense Contract Management Agency, Lockheed Martin, in Denver, and has been there since May of 2020. She's responsible for leading and managing 24 civilian and military leaders, supervisors, and technical experts to perform acquisition lifecycle contract management for Department of Defense and NASA space sis, uh, system programs. The primary mission of the team is managing contractor performance to ensure on-time delivery of quality products and services to the warfighter on time and within cost. Um, prior to selection, Augusta served as supervisory contract specialist and administrative contracting officer for Defense Contract Ma Management Agency, LMD, responsible for planning, supervising, managing, and leading 13 personnel in the execution of contract administration services for the $6 billion GPS program, as well as the $7 billion Intel and Space Systems programs. A native of LA, she received her MBA from LMU, shout out LMU, and immediately uh, started with the US Air Force in 2006. While on active duty, Augusta served as a contracting officer in Portugal, Botswana, Iraq, and Nevada, eventually attaining the rank of captain. Augusta is a level three certified acquisition professional in contracting and is a member of the Defense Acquisition Corps. Awards and recognition include DCMA LMD United We Serve Volunteer of the Year of 2015, Supervisor of the Year in 2016 and 17, Colorado Federal Executive Board Supervisor of the Year 2017, and DCMA Western Region Mentor of the Year 2019. So with that, please welcome Augusta Fain onto the stage. Thank you. I haven't been back since, uh, it's been 15 years. I can't believe how much this campus has changed. It's incredible. You guys are so lucky to be here. So it was back in uh, 2006, I was hanging out down in U-Haul, down at the ROTC detachment, and our captain came in and he said, come on into the conference room. So I walked on in and I saw three of my fellow female cadets out of a group of about 30 graduate, uh, graduating in my class, and shuffled in, sat down next to him, and the captain started talking to us, and he said, now, I think about you ladies like you're my baby sisters, some of the <laughs> finest officers that have ever come through Debt 40 LMU. But I want to tell you a little bit about some of the struggles that you might face as you enter active duty. You're going to be going into units made up of mainly men, most of them will be older than you, and 100% of them are going to be more experienced than you. And no matter what you do, no matter how flawless your execution, how inspirational your leadership, you're gonna be called one of three things. And I apologize in advance for my language. He said, you're gonna be called a bitch, a dyke, or a slut. Now, yes, I had been called all three of those things before, and that's fine. But it, this was different, that he went on to say, no matter what you do, you're not getting around it, you gotta go through it. So, oh, I forgot my clicker. All right, the down button, forward. So here I was, some of you guys might recognize some of these pictures. Wing commander of the 130 person detachment top of my class, distinguished graduate, and I felt like a fraud, like a fake, like I was gonna fail, my parents wouldn't be proud of me anymore. So I had to find a way to get through that. That three years of leadership training crashed with those three words. If I was to become a real leader, I needed to get it together, put my big girl pants on, and figure out a way to deal with the fact that the haters, that wasn't really about me. That the integrity of this leadership position I was gonna enter, that was more important than any of the personal discomfort that I felt. That my ego 
or my insecurities or my self-doubt. It wasn't about that. Leadership wasn't about me. So what is it about? Well, like a good fake, I have no idea. So I Googled it. This is what I found. I'll give you a minute to read these quotes. I like this picture of Colin Powell. He looks cool. But I have come up with a few ideas about leadership on my own. So I have said before that leadership's about how effectively my people can execute my vision without me there. I like this, but I think something's kind of missing. I say this a lot too. Always train your replacement. We're getting a little bit warmer with this one because this is about lifting others up with you. But where I've landed today is be an MVP. Make other people better. So you have your circle of control, your team, yourself, your environment. You have a circle of influence. The higher you go up in your career, it's going to become more about that circle of influence. Now, what these guys have was the ability to make other players better. They were individual superstars, yes. But they recognized, a huge Lakers fan, I apologize. But they recognized that their talent was completely wasted if they didn't share it. Why are we talking about leadership tonight? Well, let's start with that bullseye. The fact is, is that everybody needs leadership, no matter what major you are. It's the, the core, the foundation. Leadership is the vessel or the conduit that you use to spread your message. You manage things, you lead people. The lawyer is going to use the law to sway a jury of people. The salesperson is going to use some tactics to paint a picture of a better life for someone. The entrepreneur is going to use a vision to inspire a future for mankind, but people is what they all have in common. Every single job that we go into is in service of people. And you need leadership to influence people. But moving out, how do we do that? How do we do that if we feel like fakes or frauds? How do we do that if we're brand new college graduates and we've never done it before? Well, we start with that circle of control. You lead yourself before you can lead other people. So we hear the dean talk a lot about core values like moral courage, business as a force for good, creative confidence. And she says these things because they're foundational beliefs, fundamental principles that drive the behavior of this university. If you have a nice, tight set of core values, it's going to make it a whole lot easier for you to make the right decision, no matter how personally uncomfortable you might feel. I'm going to share a few of my values with you. I'm a veteran, yes. Words like integrity and excellence. I'm an adventurer, exploration, health, fitness. I'm a servant. Words like gratitude and compassion. So check me out. I just fired this M240 machine gun. That thing is bigger than I am. Pretty cool. This is a lake outside of Telluride, Colorado. This is where I had my wedding ceremony. And that's my baby girl, Zion. She's a therapy animal. On Tuesday nights, I drive her up to the Denver foster home. She gets pet by all the kids for hours at a time. She loves it. She's got the best job in the world, yes. Now, you will be questioned at your core throughout your whole entire career. For me, it manifests as imposter syndrome, that feeling that you're not worthy of your success. So you heard in my bio, you know, contracts director, uh, billion dollar portfolio, GPS satellites, blah, blah, blah. But what I could say is that my boss retired and they had nobody else for the job. Yeah, I could say that. So check me out in 2009. I was getting ready to get on that Blackhawk, fly up to Mosul Airfield, where 
We had to execute a combat landing because at that time the Mosul airfield was so hot it was a rainbow of mortar fire and things that liked to explode. Y'all think I look pretty sweet, right? I'm pretty tough, I'm pretty badass. Can you guys relate to this? <laughs> yes, that is me. <laughs> so I got me a, a fancy job title. I got a big office. I got a name plaque. I have people who manage my calendar for me. And I still feel like this. And that's OK. I'm, I'm here to give you hope that I'm not going to give you some Raw, raw pump up speech. But what I'm going to tell you is that it's okay to feel like this. I still feel like this all the time. In 2005, Lieutenant Mike Murphy found himself in a firefight with the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they were pinned up in a cliff wall. They weren't able to get a radio signal to call for help. So Lieutenant Murphy ran out from his position of cover took fire, engaged on the radio, got shot in the back, dropped the radio, fell to the ground, picked up the radio, finished making his call. Help came. We lost him that day. But he won the Medal of Honor because in a split second, he understood and accepted the gravity of his situation. He owned that as the officer in charge, he was responsible. He sprang into action. I think you can all understand what the impact of that was. Step one is acceptance. Acceptance means a gracious willingness to be with whatever is happening. Acceptance, this is legit stuff. This is the first step in any addiction recovery. It's also the last step in the five stages of grief. This one reminds me of the Dean's core value of lifelong learners. Because we have all committed as business professionals that we do not know everything. Mm -mm. That leads us into ownership. Jocko Willink, the author of Extreme Ownership and Navy SEAL, says very dramatically, own everything in your world. Own your mistakes, own your shortfalls, own your problems, own the solutions to your problems. And then the whole room explodes in, in uh, celebrating him. This reminds me of the Dean's core value of moral courage. That drives us into action. Do something. Take a step forward. Lean in. Yes, you can. So many times we're paralyzed with admiring problems. Or at my work, we like to over-engineer solutions so that we never, we never fix it. Sometimes, yeah, that bad decision can be better than no decision at all. This reminds me of our core value here of creative confidence. And that takes us to the most important part, capture the impact of your actions. Capture the return on investment, quantify it, articulate it to your people so they can then accept that they did make a difference and they can do it again and go all the way back through the circle. We are all going to have plenty of mountains to climb throughout our careers. In 2006, I was getting ready to go to Iraq. And these genius military doctors thought that I had developed some kind of heart condition. So test after test, blood work, EKGs, the whole deal. They couldn't figure out what was going wrong. So they said, oh, we think you have some kind of inflammation in your sternum, making you feel like you're having a heart attack all the time. Awesome. How do I, how do I fix it? They said, well, it's probably stress related. So I rolled my eyes and I walked out of the room, went to Iraq. When I got back, I went through a series of psychological evaluations. They wanted to know how my deployment went. So I said, yeah, you know, I never had to draw my weapon or anything. Some things exploded over my head. But overall, I'm sleeping fine, you know, drinking socially, got a good diet and exercise. I'm fine. What I meant was that I'm not sleeping. I drink too much. I'm addicted to extreme endurance exercise and obsessed with my diet. A few years later, 
I got out of the military, problems went on, and I went to the VA, the Veterans Administration. I got another psychological evaluation done. This time, I told them what was up. And they said, congratulations. You got yourself an anxiety disorder, a little bit of PTSD sprinkled on top. No problem. We have a program for it. We can help. I thought, OK, cool. It's free. I ain't got nothing to lose. I'll go for it. So as I went through this therapy program, I learned that 40 million Americans, 18%, one in five, look around, one in five, suffer from some kind of anxiety disorder. Through the therapy, I learned that that was OK, that it was normal, that it was fine, that I could do something about it. I didn't have to be afraid of it. I could accept it. Once I accepted it, I took ownership of it. I didn't blame George Bush. I didn't blame my parents. I didn't blame the military. I didn't blame war. I didn't blame Al-Qaeda. I own the solution. So I took action. I went to the therapy. I stopped drinking. I started meditating. To this day, I'm a student of ancient philosophies, Buddhism, Stoicism. And I take every opportunity I can to learn and talk about mental health. And the impact of that is I'm able, I'm, I'm happy, healthy, confident enough to stand up in front of 80, 50 of my closest friends who I've never met before <laughs> and tell you all about it. So I'm going to call you to action. How can you use a model like this as you embark on your own career? How can you set a set of core values for yourself, stick to them? How can you show up for yourself? Because this is not going to be an easy journey. But you all showed up tonight. I am exceptionally proud of you all. I don't even know you, and I love you all. I can't wait to see you guys enter the workforce. I'm so excited to see what you're going to do. So with that, I welcome all and any questions. Please engage with me. I'm here to help. Thank you. So what we'd, what we'd like to do next is, first of all, thanks, Augusta, for just sharing an incredible story, for showing that you're a little bit vulnerable, that you're able to share with all of us who have not met, and, uh, and, and to give uh, to give a nod to creative confidence when it really does feel like we appreciate that. So Anna and I talked together and we came up with a few questions, but we also want to encourage everybody else here to answer some questions too. But I know Anna was going to kick us off with the first one. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Augusta, again. Uh, what were some of the critical moments in your career where you needed to make some tough choices and develop confidence around a particular direction you were embarking on? Okay, so <laughs> this is so on, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, a tough decisions. Okay, so the the thing that comes to mind is the time that I had to fire someone. Um, <laughs> this is not a fun thing that you guys should try to ever do. Um, you may have heard in the uh, in the in the government that it, it takes an act of Congress to fire someone. Uh, that's almost true. <laughs> But uh, it was really difficult for the rest of my team. That was, that was kind of the issue. The, my team was looking at me and saying, why aren't you doing anything about this poor performer? I, I couldn't tell them I'm getting ready to fire her or anything like that, but um, they, were, they were all looking at me. They were all watching me. So it, it comes back to that, that concept that my leadership role was more important than how uncomfortable I was. And I had conversations with her over and over, and she would just bawl her eyes out. And I mean, I had to, I had to turn off any kind of empathy or compassion that I had, because I had to do the right thing. Um, just the integrity of the whole situation was what got me through it. Yeah, I keep thinking of the bigger picture, and that is very hard. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like a really hard I wish it upon no one. <laughs> but don't you think it should be hard to fire people? Hmm. In other words, when it becomes easy, have we missed something as a leader? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think the, the government's probably a little bit different, and 
Just want to also use this as a recruiting tool. We're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> so the government, I think it's exceptionally harder. It, it took two years to go through this whole process. I got um, an EEO complaint against me. I got union grievances. Basically, I, I, she was suing me over and over again in, in our professional uh, arena. Um, dragged me through the mud. It was, it was brutal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of liability to take on yeah. and a lot of risk that you have to and the courage to do that. Would you say that you're a risk taker and how does that usually like work out for you if you are? Mm. Well, yeah, I'd like to think so. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I work for the government. So um, it would take an act of Congress to fire me. Um, I, I, I studied entrepreneurship when I was here. And uh, that was my MBA focus area. Um, I have no idea why I picked that, because I did not have the entrepreneurial spirit whatsoever. I really wanted to. You know, give me a set of rules, I can follow the set of rules just fine, which is why the military worked out really well. <laughs> um, but I, yes, I am a risk taker. Um, I find myself quite often uh, tactfully attempting to tell my bosses everything they're doing wrong. Um, so uh, sometimes it works out. Uh, sometimes I'm like, ooh. <laughs> this is sounding good. It reminds me of some of the conversations I have with the provost. Oh, I forgot we're recording this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, earlier you talked about in, in your uh, in your talk about the imposter syndrome. Um, I know that's a topic that one of our faculty members here and how it goes gets out of also speaks about. And and you indicated that it's okay to, to have those feelings. But I'm wondering if you could share with us and give us advice of. How do you exactly work through it? I mean, the whole dynamics of when you're feeling like that little girl in the picture, when you have to be tough, what's the process that you kind of go through mentally and how you, you know, get yourself up and think, I deserve to be here? Well, I guess I don't really know if I ever get to the point where I say I deserve to be here, uh, even now, um, sitting in front of all of you, but I think it, it starts with, like I was saying, knowing that it's gonna happen and knowing that it's okay. And knowing that everybody's gonna feel that way. Um, I, was, I was talking to one of my, uh, my, my buddies about the talk tonight and she said that was the part of it that kind of resonated a lot with her is, you hear a lot about imposter syndrome and it's always, you know, you can do it, you got this, we can beat this, rah, rah, but she said that none of her education has ever talked about being okay with it, mm -hmm. with accepting it. And I kind of see it as a, an opportunity to check myself where, okay, I'm gonna use a little bit of emotional intelligence right now and kind of try to look at things objectively and see if you know this is legit. I'm not gonna, you know, there's an intrinsic and ex extrinsic attribution theory. Intrinsic is, you know, I'm, I'm the reason for my success. Extrinsic is everybody else is the reason for my failures. Um, but I, I use it as the opportunity to check myself. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking on that, I know at the beginning you were mentioning how your captain already warned you even before you graduated um, about the struggles as a woman. Um, would you say that women have it harder? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> um, the short answer is yes, only if you think you do. Okay. The long answer is no. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I guess that just kind of goes with everybody has a struggle. Um, whether you're a woman, whether you're gay, whether you're overweight, whether you're Jewish, whatever it is, you're, you're gonna have some kind of insecurity, you're gonna have some kind of struggle. I, I think it's important for us to be empathetic people and realize that, that everybody else has something. Mm -hmm. um, so, being a, being a woman, um, 
I have maybe in, intentionally tried to not let that be a thing for me. Yeah. Um, just that my dad's in the audience right there, so just to kind of embarrass him a little bit. <laughs> he would, and I never understood at the time, but he would sit me on his lap and say, you know, you're a woman and you're gonna do amazing things and you can be president and you can conquer the world. I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, but I was, as an adult, I'm so thankful that he did that because it was true. Um, at least for me, I mean, I had instances, yes, I've been sexually harassed before, um, but I get to control how I react to it. Yeah. I can't control external circumstances. The only thing I can control is m my emotions and my reactions. Yeah. So I guess that's what I choose to focus on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, do you have any advice for women and for men in the audience that might be feeling the same way or thinking about those kinds of things? Um, it's, it's a thing if you let it be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you choose to focus on that, then yes, it will be, it will be your struggle. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you choose to you know, get stuck in admiring the problem, uh, you won't be able to, to blast past it. Uh, and then again, just I, these days, the celebration of diversity is, is better than we've ever seen it. So it, it's really an opportunity to, to, again, be empathetic to each other and know that every single person is a person of dignity, treat each other with respect, all that kind of stuff. So now more than ever, uh, we, we have a, a great opportunity in front of us to do that. You know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about uh, issues like that and the fact that people can do that. Oftentimes, I think that it's the culture of the organization that, that enables that. And you mentioned earlier, Augusta, that the military is hiring. I mean, there's professional business kinds of jobs all over. Um, and maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but uh, there's many who would say that the military is not a female-friendly culture, um, that the culture is a, a real barrier to uh, achievement, even from the captain in ROTC who started, you know, that you shared those three words that sort of set up what the culture is like. Um, how do you start to create a more hospitable culture where people can bring everything that they have to the party, everything they have to be successful, you know, given that you sometimes have those attitudes or cultural barriers? Well, that's a big question, too. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about it. Um, We've gotten kind of weird lately where we don't know what to call each other or maybe we're afraid of offending each other, so we just don't talk about it. But let's just start talking about it more. We, we do a, a thing at my work, um, a diversity and inclusion day, um, where even the, you know, your, your token middle-aged white guy gets up in front of everybody and talks about times that he's dealt with diversity or he's been the awkward guy in the room. Um, and it, that kind of freedom to be able to talk about it was really groundbreaking and enlightening for everybody and connecting. It connected people. Um, so that, that would be where I would start. I would talk about it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Creating this sort of... Um different kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. Some people call them uncomfortable conversations. Well, I want to talk about them more so they get to the place where they're not uncomfortable. Can you, can you share an example of where maybe you were in that uncomfortable conversation? Oh, really? <laughs> that wasn't on my list of questions. It's just you really are beginning to it. I'm, I'm, I'm just intrigued. No, I, I have a story. Um, Okay, so, and in the spirit of just openly talking about it, I'm just going to talk about it. I had um, an African American employee who came to me one day and said, I heard James uh, make a racial slur. And I said, okay, why don't you tell me about it? And she said, she was, he, uh, this guy was pointing to Michelle's cube, who uh, Michelle was another African American female, and he said, look, there's two of them. And I said, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about how that was maybe racially charged. Um, 
And she did, and I said, okay, well, let me go talk to him. And I went and found James, and he said, I wasn't even there that day. And so first, she accused the wrong guy of this thing. I ended up finding out who it actually was, and I said, you were in Michelle's Cube the other day, and you said something like, there's two of them. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And he said, oh, yeah, we were talking about the empty cubicles. There's two empty cubicles. So I went back to her, and I told her, basically, OK, I, I want to be as culturally sensitive about this, but you, you openly accused a white male of, of racism. And now you opened up that he can essentially make a complaint against you. So let, let's address that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very uncomfortable conversation, uh, but it, it was, you know, liberating, I mm -hmm. suppose. And it, it also gave me a little bit of confidence that, yeah, I can have those kinds of difficult conversations. Yeah. And it's OK. Yeah, I, I, I think you make a really interesting point, because in the, in the charged environment where we're talking about DEI, so many of us are afraid to have the conversation because we'll be taken the wrong way or we'll be understood in a slightly different way. And that the role of leaders are really to make those conversations more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I guess that starts by putting yourself out there. Maybe it's all about moral courage. Yeah, I was telling, um, we were talking about this the other day with the chapter and I was saying there's never a right time to be uncomfortable. Like you're always going to be uncomfortable until it's not. So. You just have to tackle it. You've accepted it. Yep. <laughs> yes. I'm going through the stages. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> um, but I also want to open it, open it up to the crowd in case there's any other questions. Um, I know we have some questions, but there, if there are any, feel free to raise your hand or anything, and we can pass sure. around a mic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely I, anything. Open I, book. I can speak loudly. Um, You're OK? OK, I'm cool with that. I, um, my name's Olivia. Thank you so much for your talk. And I was just wondering, how do you balance being an effective leader and sometimes saying things people don't want to hear and the desire to want to be liked? <laughs> uh, this is uh, show business, not show friends, uh, to quote Jerry Maguire. Um, so to balance that, I think that the answer is I don't balance it very well. I am uh, more in line with the first one where I just kind of say it. Um, and yeah, I piss people off a lot, and that's fine. Um, and I think that that's fine because integrity, it, it goes right back to the integrity of my leadership position is more important than any kind of personal discomfort. Um, so I don't care if you like me or not. I mean, I care if you like me, Olivia. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, good one. Keep them coming. Uh, earlier, you mentioned owning shortcomings and uh, the action to resolve that. Throughout your career, how did you identify what you needed to work on, and how did you yeah, come up with solutions for that? I'm perfect. What do you mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we study in my, I, I made this leadership development program at work and we study the Pareto principle, the 80-20. Um, so there's this book called, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's about uh, spending 80% of your time on the things that you're good at. And then the things that you're not good at, don't really worry about them. Uh, I, I, kind of go against the grain on, on that theory a little bit. And I like to spend the 80% of my time on, on things that I'm not good at. Uh, I'm afraid of a lot of things. No jokes. I, I found that the way I get over things that I'm afraid of is exposure therapy. Uh, so I'm afraid of the dark. I'll share that with you all. So this last year I went to a survival school uh, where I had to go by myself alone in the woods with nothing but a blanket and a tarp and build myself a shelter and sleep overnight. Um, and, and that kind of sort of helped with my fear of the dark. Um, but that, that's, that's not a professional example, but that's just the kind of uh, 
hard charging attitude that I that I like to engage with um, when I'm afraid of something I that's what I have to do good question thank you I didn't catch your name my name's Alex I appreciate it we're friends <laughs> <laughs> who else got one over there and one over here what was the most oh I'm Danny by the way hi hi I'm uh, smiling <laughs> me too. Um, what was the most impactful leadership uh, lesson that you learned while on deployment? Ugh. Um, again, I'm going to have to fall back on integrity. Uh, follow that one up with a story that I had a, um, you know, a, a, a co-officer with me. And uh, so the, the profession of uh, contracting officer is we're, we're the ones with the checkbook. So she was um, kind of taking advantage of her authority a little bit and asking the contractor for, you know, a, a, a nicer car, a new bed. I don't have hot water in my chew. Like, you're lucky we have water. Um, so I kind of fell back on that integrity because the contractor actually came to me and said, he, I was a lieutenant at the time and she was a captain, she outranked me. And the contractor said, you gotta get your captain together. So that was definitely a challenge and it, it was about the integrity. Again, I, I went and I called her out and it was really, really uncomfortable and she continued to do it and I, I, kept, I kept on her. Um, I'd like to say that that had some kind of happy ending, but it didn't. But the, the integrity of, of my position and the integrity of my authority, with, uh, authority was, the, was the guiding principle across the board. So integrity. Thank can you I, for that. Can I just follow up on, on Danny's question? So you said you were outranked and you still were able to put yourself out there and say, hey, I'm not, I'm, i got to call this out. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what other advice could you give us around managing up like that? Ooh. I love managing up. <laughs> uh, my boss doesn't like it too much, but I really <laughs> like it. <laughs> um, so in order to be a good leader, you have to be a follower first. Um, and I don't get paid to uh, come up with the strategic vision for, for my organization. That's my boss's job. So in terms of following, I, I have to own his mission as if it's my own mission. And, and I don't really get to make a decision about the right way to do it. You know, as long as it's moral and legal, ethical, all that kind of stuff, I, I don't get to dictate, you know, his strategy. Um, I follow it. So I follow it as if it's my own. And when I'm communicating it to my people, I'm not going to go to them and say, well, the boss came up with this idea. We got to execute it, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't like it either. No, I'm not going to say stuff like that. I'm going to start with the why and I'm going to explain this change needs to happen. Here's why. Here's how it's going to positively affect you. If you have concerns, you can tell me about them. But yeah, this is the way forward and we're going to kick ass when we do it. So followership, it starts with followership. Cool. There was a question over here. Yeah, no, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for your service to our country. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, Olivia. You, yeah. <laughs> how do you inspire people who may not want to have the same action? Like they're not as passionate in working as you are. Yeah. Great question. Impact. Um, articulating the impact, um, and that and that kind of goes with the starting starting with the why. Um, so. You know, uh, at my work, they roll out a new computer system um, and it totally sucks and everybody's complaining about it and it's, you know, wasting time and they're looking at that little circle of death for 20 minutes. They can't do their job. So the, the why behind that, I'll, I'll have to figure that out and, and explain it to them. Kind of, you know, sell it, 
get them on board, get their buy-in. So, you know, I know that the system isn't ideal, but it came about because, you know, we needed a, a, a one-stop shop repository and it can be beneficial to you and here's how. And in the meantime, you know, give me your complaints and I'll address them with the help ticket thing. Um, but it's tough. I mean, there's no magic formula for that. Your uh, haters are gonna hate. Uh, people are kind of always gonna be unhappy sometimes. You can't please everybody, that whole kind of thing. And you know, it goes along with your question before. Would you rather be, you know, followed or liked? Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank kind you. Of, kind of as a follow up to that, um, I've heard a lot recently, like, you know, your career, you're gonna fail a lot, and you need to bounce back. You need to make it, you know, you need to make it work. You need to go to the next one. You need to recover from it. Do you have any advice for us for that? Because I feel like a lot of us might be going into you know, senior year or post-grad and might fail and might start a job we hate and then we might have to quit and then we might have to find a new job or we might be unemployed. Um, how do you put up with so much failure and how do you just get back up again? Do you have any advice for that? Sure, but do me a solid first and define failure. Define failure? Yeah, well, what's that mean? I guess like it's personal to everyone, but I would say like, probably for a lot of people and a lot of students is just not meeting up to the expectations that you have for yourself or that you have that other people have of you. And even if that if failure is a big term or like a loose term, um, it still doesn't feel good. So <laughs> I think it's just not not feeling well about something that you did and being disappointed okay. and having to overcome that feeling and get back up again. Okay. I'm not trying to be fake when I say this, but there's no such thing. Um, there's only opportunities to learn. So, you know, Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, uh, you know, he, he tried 140 times and he said that every time he tried it was just another data point. And uh, Steve Jobs, he got fired from Apple uh, when he was in his 30s. And he came back and said, well, that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because then I got to do this whole Pixar thing and invented Pixar. And then it next, uh, next gen or whatever that other thing was and then Apple bought it and then he got hired back from Apple and then you know he met his wife when he was fired and all that kind of stuff. So he, he says that you can never you know, connect the dots in the future. You can look back, yes, but you're, you're never gonna know you, what junction in the road you took and where that's gonna take you, and, and a failure isn't a failure, it's just a turn. Um, something will come of it. And I, I guess I, I wanna encourage, and I know this, I'm all Pollyanna all over the place with this one, but um, it's, it's just a data point to learn from. And, and that comes back to acceptance. You know, if you fail a test, accept it. You failed the test. What are you gonna do about it? Like own it. You failed the test. It wasn't your, you know, mean professor. And then take an action, you know, study next time. And then when you pass the test next time, boom, impact. I know, I sound like a, woo. Oh, we teach, we, no, we teach that in entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> hey, uh, Jason DeMello here, professor in entrepreneurship and fellow alum from the MBA program. Uh, Do we problem. know each other? Uh, I think I'm a couple of years after. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a very nice way of saying he's younger. Oh, yeah, yeah. But don't take me personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love your bibliography. I want to talk about that. The Man's Search for Meaning is a book on my desk upstairs that I really encourage students to read. Yeah. Uh, but I have a question about uh, the title on the right, Inside Out. Would you mind making a pitch about that? Oh, Pixar. Yes. Have you seen it? Oh, it's so good. Leave right now, go home and watch it. <laughs> it's so good. Okay, so this is a movie about um, the five basic emotions. 
uh, help me out. It's it's happiness, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust. And it it's basically the the moral of the story to give it away is that without sadness, you can't feel happiness. So I thought that it was just you know I've never heard it described to me like this before that all of these emotions exist for a reason. You know, disgust is there uh, primarily to keep you from eating poison. So when you're disgusted by something, you can embrace that. That's a cool feeling. I, I'm so amazed that the human body can do that. And then also fear. A lot of uh, irrational behavior is often motivated by fear. <laughs> So if we can understand that fear is trying to tell us something and that we, we can and we should listen to it, we don't need to fear the fear, then you know, we can embrace it and be with it and have that gracious willingness to accept whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. So all you go home and watch it. It's awesome. I think we had a marketing agency to uh, <laughs> have <laughs> questions here in the audience. You guys are crushing these questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kirsten. I guess related to that question, I myself have a, a favorite book and it's impacted me like deeply. So I wanted to ask out of these set of books, if you had a favorite and if so, which one like impacted you the most as well? My favorite of these right now is Extreme Ownership. Um, Oh, it's so intense. It's so brilliant. I actually have the workbook for it in my briefcase right there. I carry it around with me. Um, he uses stories from his time in the Battle of Ramadi in Iraq, which was, you know, the bloodiest battle of the uh, Iraq War. And he, he tells a story about a time that there was a friendly fire that, you know, Marines accidentally shot army dudes and about how he was required to give a, a back brief of the situation that happened and all these generals flew in and you know heads were gonna roll and he stood up in front of everybody and he said you know I could blame blah 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 but this is my fault he said everything that went on you know the guy who shot the the bad radio call all of it was my fault I mean he wasn't even there physically he was, you know, out on the out on the edge in a safe place. He was the officer in charge. He wasn't even there, um, and he took absolute ownership of the whole entire situation and didn't get fired. And then when he did that, everyone else in his unit stood up and said, "No, that was my fault. That part of it was my fault." So his message of ownership was just contagious throughout the whole unit. Um, I mean, the impact of that was just huge. That's another hand up. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm another Alex, but I wanted to ask that uh, every time I, I meet someone um, who is also in the from a big military family, so like I've met a lot of people in the military, but I'm very curious because they always seem to have a favorite or go-to story. So could I ask you what your go-to story is and what you got out of it? Um. <laughs> You want like a war story or something? <laughs> whenever, whenever somebody says, oh, like this has been your life, your experience, like what are you going to do? Everyone seems to have a, a yeah. story. So I'm curious what your idea is. The first um, that pops in your head. I'll tell a story I haven't told yet. Um, so it was, it was mentioned in my bio too that I did some work in Botswana, Africa. And uh, well, the, the work that we were doing is we were building uh, AIDS clinics and orphanages. And I got an opportunity to go down to Botswana, spend a few weeks down there and do the site visits. And uh, we, we went to one of the orphanages and blew me away. Like, I mean, tears everywhere. The, the work that we were doing as the U.S. military in this humanitarian mission of building orphanages and literally saving lives and I got to go see it and these kids were they were treating me like a jungle gym it was amazing they were climbing all over me and thanking me and they had a little uh they sang this song that they had been rehearsing for us just tear fest it was amazing 
So hmm. I, I'll, I'll leave. That'll be my example. Hmm. I think we have time for maybe one last question. Dad, what do you want no, to ask no, your daughter? <laughs> I think we're out of time. <laughs> I think I'll put you on the spot here. You've described an awful lot of introspection in your adult life. Have you ever taken the time to examine why that little girl was in uniform? <laughs> well, my my beautiful mother, I know that she uh, she decorated the helmet with some pearls, and she had, <laughs> she put a little mink vest on me, and it was GI Jane. Um, <clears throat> but I I'd like to think it was driven by a set of, of values. So my family, yes, very honest and, and do the right thing kind of people. Um, that was always modeled very, very well. What? <laughs> that, that dad's approving, likes oh, that answer. Yeah, and um, the, the, the integrity to do what's right when nobody's looking you know, don't listen to the haters. I, I dealt with a, a childhood bully too. Um, don't, you know, don't listen to them. You're doing the right thing, march on, that kind of thing. And also my grandpa, um, mm -hmm. like many of us, my grandpa was in uh, World War II and he was in the, the third wave on D-Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember as little kids, my brother and I were always playing with his war memorabilia and having him tell stories about all the great food he ate uh, <laughs> when he was in, in Germany and, and France and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that definitely played, played a role in why I joined the military. Um, so, I, I have my family, thank you for, for priming that one, I, I have my whole family, my grandpa, um, to thank for all of that. It's amazing what shapes us as leaders. Um, we're out of time. I have a feeling we could sit and we could ask Augusta lots and lots of questions, but she's an alum, and my guess is you could probably link in with her. Um, she I got has, one of those. She has an amazing career managing literally billions of dollars of moving goods and supplies, and, and I think the lessons that she shared with us tonight are very powerful ones. And um, it was always it's wonderful as a dean to sit here and listen to somebody who is moving millions of dollars of people and equipment across the world and recognize that, wow, we're actually teaching the right things. I'll say to my faculty line right over there. Um, so that felt pretty validating. Anyway, will you join me in a big round of lion applause? Thanks to our tech crew, to Roberta Coleman over there, who worked very closely with me and engaging our alumni, um, and Nancy Donovan, who's back there, who does a lot of the support in making these events happen. And to Delta Sigma Pi, thanks for co-sponsoring the CBA.